Good morning, everybody. My name is, in fact, Bud Johnson. It's not fake. I've been accused of that a couple times. My wife, Sarah, back in Savannah, Georgia, I believe she's watching now. Uh, we have four kids together. Titus is nine. Four, who said woo? Yeah, it's, it's, sometimes it feels like 14, yeah. Uh, my Titus is nine, or Titus is nine, Maggie is seven, Finn is five, and Theo is almost three in January. We do live in Savannah, Georgia. It's a little bit warmer than today. It's, I don't know if some of the folks down here, they've been seeing me shiver kind of like a, whew, as we're warming up, but I really appreciate the encouragement and the fellowship and soon to win that warm arm around me when I need it. Mm. <clears throat> we are down in Savannah, Georgia. Come visit us sometimes. We homeschool our kids. We have an assembly in our home, Christ Church in Savannah. And I really just wanted to take a moment here and express our love for y'all, for this group of people and so many more, knowing that there are God-fearing men and women around the country, around the world, conquering for King Jesus, and has a, that has a significant role in sustaining us down in the low country. We are a little ways away from y'all, but it really does sustain us so far away. So thank you for your continued service, and come visit us sometime. We'd love to have you. Now, the last time I was here, I was, was about eight years ago, so some of y'all might recognize me. Uh, it's a lot of new faces. I love meeting new people. Last time I was here, I was talking about our southern hospitality a little bit, saying that in the South we like to hug and kiss, and COVID has been rough on us, right? <laughs> we like to hug and kiss, and here in Montana, I kept meeting new people, and I kept getting this Montana handshake. I'm just kind of itching, like pulling people in, a little, little side hugs here and there, a little side hugs over here. I kept greeting, getting greeted with this handshake. Some of y'all might remember that, but some of y'all might not know that after the Lord's Day message, I'm walking with my son down this way. I think he had to use the restroom or something. And out of nowhere, with the strength of 10 Virginians, Mark Miller grabs me from behind, hoists me into the air, and proves to me that y'all can, in fact, hug quite ferociously <laughs> here in Montana. Do you remember that? You remember that all? A little bit? Yeah. <clears throat> and I'm not saying it was Mark's impressive Montana-style hug, but would you know the next day back in Virginia... I was in the hospital for a ruptured appendix. Did you know that? <clears throat> so, forgive me, it's been a few years since I visited. I think I was processing some of that traumatic experience. For the record, I prefer the hugs from the front, Mark, just anybody else. <clears throat> Speaking of traumatic experiences, how's everyone been these last 18 months? Yeah, awesome. I love that y'all said that so fast. It hasn't been the case for everybody. And if, uh, if I'm being a little honest, sometimes it's been a little hard on me. So to pay the bills down in Savannah, Georgia, I'm a wedding photographer. You know what weddings are, right? Giant parties, several hundred people gathered together in tight spaces, eating together, dancing together, often exhaustingly late into the, uh, into the night, you know, when your immune system is at its peak, its finest. The last year and a half has been kind of interesting around our parts. It's taken a little bit of a toll on some people around us. Honestly, it's taken a little bit toll on me too. It's tough sometimes. You know, you get a little beat down some here and there, and down in Savannah, Georgia, I would, will admit it's a little far from y'all. It can get sometimes a little lonely if, you're not, if you don't have your head on straight. Sometimes you get that bad doctor's report, lost job, you find out if your job's essential. That's kind of fun, right? Find out real fast, whatever that means. Sometimes you're not entirely sure what the future holds here. I don't say these things to promote weakness. I'm not looking for you to go easy on me or promote some new normal that these people are trying to lean into. I say these things because I think some of you might be able to relate. And I think many of you have probably gone through some of the same problems. But I know every single one of us can overcome those doubts and fears. Every single one of us are equipped with the tools and the weapons required to fight these doubts and droughts, which I believe is quite timely around here, right? It's been a little dry. <clears throat> if I start talking like this, it's between the smoke and the allergies. Whew. He has helped us fight these doubts and droughts, and Jesus has given us the powerful pictures necessary to visualize and pictures we need to develop in our minds. So if some of you can relate to the distractions, I pray to God today that you can relate to the successes as well. Because today we're not celebrating or commiserating failures or fear or death. We are developing pictures, powerful pictures, through the prophets. Now I know that if you're under 30, you might not have any idea what developing pictures means. <clears throat> 
So let me help you. Imagine this for a second. You've got a box, maybe the size of like a small shoe box. It's got a hole in it, operated not by electricity, but by wound springs. This hole, when triggered manually, is open and shut in the blink of an eye, letting radioactive photons rush into the box at 670,619,629 miles per hour, bombarding a sensitive strip of emulsion containing microscopically small, light-sensitive silver halide crystals. You can't see this process. In fact, seeing it would ruin it. But nonetheless, you depress the button, take the photo, wind the film to the next 120 or 35 millimeters, and you start the whole process over again. Those light-sensitive silver halide crystals would remain comfortably wound in a tight cylinder until a special, highly acidic chemical is applied to the silver crystals in absolute darkness, usually by a professional third party. Finally, after hours, days, potentially decades, you can feast your eyes on this kind of uh, poop-colored, this inverted, desaturated likeness of your friends and your family, frankly, the things of nightmares. If you've seen film, you kind of know what I'm talking about. You ever held that up? Whew! Kind of scary. But then after carefully selecting your favorite, let's say sepia this time, sepia-colored, desaturated, inverted representation of your photo, you then overlay this chemically induced emulsion over yet another chemically charged piece of paper, blast yet another round of pure white, 670,616,629 mile per hour light, and our sepia-toned, desaturated, inverted film unveils to us our photo, also known as a developed picture. Now, I wanted to explain this whole process to you because even though today this entire process is electronic and instant and all happens without a, about a two millimeter uh, space, the fundamentals are the same. The photons still enter your camera's lens. Your sensors are still exposed to that light. Your digital camera, or even your phone these days. Uh, real quick point, you know, I know as a professional photographer, people always ask me, are you concerned about these camera phones? They're getting so good. Are you gonna be out of business? I personally love it. All of you, every single one of you, partake in my career, the thing I love, the thing I do. Each one of you got a phone in your pocket that takes incredible photographs. I find extreme value in that, and there's a lesson to be learned in that. It's got its own light-sensitive particles, translates that data into an image that we can see and understand. And it's this translation process, this development process that most of us take completely for granted. We point, we click, we view, we done. <laughs> the development is instant. The satisfaction, instant. The, the ability to share your photograph experience, instant. One of the most popular photo sharing apps in the world, Instagram. People all over the world are using these new technologies to communicate, to express ideas internationally. Did you know over 95 million photos are shared every day on Instagram alone. If that many are shared on Instagram, how many are not? How many iPhones have thousands of photos locked in this private photo gallery for no one to see? Who here thinks that they have the most photos on their phone? I'm genuinely curious. Phil, I saw a quick hand. We got a couple hands up there. I'm really curious. If you could, I'm going to take a pause here. Pull out your phone. I really want to know. Open up that photo app, maybe in your recent. See like that. See how many you got. And just to kind of set a bar, I'm a professional photographer. I have 55,000 photos in my album. I know you're all laughing. I take a lot of pictures. A lot of y'all are in a lot of them, by the way. But just curious, what do we got here? What are some of these numbers? Anybody willing? How many? 20,000. 20, That's pretty good numbers. 39. 39 whole <laughs> photographs. <laughs> They're all selfies, aren't they, Dan? Yeah. Yeah. <clears throat> what we got? That's awesome. Lots of good, incredible views from the plane. You know, I love that we take a lot of photos. I, it's, it, like I said, a professional photographer, it means a lot to me. When we're talking about learning lessons from powerful pictures from the prophets, we have to ask ourselves, are these pictures being developed in our minds? Or are they locked in some photo album, hidden in a drawer, or just completely missed altogether? Because just like developing pictures is a process, developing the pictures we see through the prophets 
is going to be a process too. So this morning's photo that I would like to develop with you is found in Isaiah chapter 53. Let's turn there together. And we're also going to cover this development process in general. How to help ourselves develop even more pictures from the prophets. And perhaps maybe fewer photos from the world. So we're going to read together. Isaiah chapter 53, all 12 verses. By the way, I wanted to start this and say, I, what do they say now? I want to yield my time. Because if you had a chance to hear Mr. Miller this morning, uh, if you didn't, check out the recordings and things. I would, <laughs> if I could, I'd yield my time. No, I'm just kidding. But we'll continue. Chapter 53. Who has believed our message? And to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? For he grew up before him like a tender shoot, and like a root out of parched ground. He has no stately form or majesty that we should look upon him, nor appearance that we should be attracted to him. He was despised, forsaken of men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief, and like one from whom men hide their face. He was despised, and we did not esteem him. Surely our griefs he himself bore, and our sorrows he carried. Yet we ourselves esteemed him stricken, smitten of God, afflicted. But he was pierced through for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The chastening for our well-being fell upon him. And by his scourging, we are healed. All of us, like sheep, have gone astray. Each of us has turned to his own way. But the Lord has caused the iniquity of us all to fall on him. He was oppressed. He was afflicted. Yet he did not open his mouth like a lamb that is led to a slaughter and like a sheep that is silent before its shears. So he did not open his mouth. By oppression and judgment, he was taken away. And as for his generation who considered that he was cut off from the land of the living, for the transgression of my people to whom the stroke was due, his grave was assigned with wicked men, yet he was with the rich man in his death because he had done no violence, nor was there any deceit in his mouth. But the Lord was pleased to crush him, putting him to grief. If he would render himself as a guilt offering, he would see his offspring. He will prolong his days, and the good pleasure of the Lord will prosper in his hand. As a result of the anguish of his soul, he will see it and be satisfied. By his knowledge, the righteous one, my servant, will justify the many, as he will bear their iniquities. Therefore, I will allot him a portion with the great. And he will divide the treasure with the strong because he poured out himself to death and was numbered with the transgressors. Yet he himself bore the sin of many and interceded for the transgressors. What a picture. What vivid language for us to visualize. God's bombarding us not just at the infinitely high speed of light, but he's spanning here millennia. Almost eight centuries before the Christ, more than 2,000 years after, God has gone to great lengths for us today to develop this picture, to see what he sees, to see what he saw, to share in this experience. So what do you see? Who do you see? We all know how a picture is developed using a camera now. So how do we develop this picture in our minds? In preparing for this message, I decided to ask some other photographers I know. I have a lot of friends in the industry, some other professionals. And I wanted them to define for me what a powerful picture is. And I didn't tell them it was necessarily for this type of presentation. And I'm looking forward to using that as an opportunity to share it with them. But I wanted to know, these professional photographers, people who do this for a living, what's a powerful picture anyways? Do you mind if I read some of these responses to you today? A friend of mine said, a powerful photo elicits a strong emotion and keeps pulling you back into it. Another friend said, the most powerful photos are the ones unexpected, a treat or a surprise, 
or even a revelation in the composition. I love that they use that terminology. I'm coming back to him later. But, and man, Matt starting, off, starting us off with this idea of something you would have never guessed, never seen, something not of the ordinary, not of the physical realm, something more eternal, something more permanent. But there's a revelation in the composition. A photo is worth a thousand words. A powerful photo is worth a library, a friend of mine said. <laughs> One of my friends said, time travel. Time travel, it makes a powerful photo. Looking at it and being transported in that time to, the, to that moment to experience it just as the subjects did. A powerful picture is one where the message is actually understood. You get it. The story in the photo can be understood no matter who views it. That's pretty powerful. Powerful picture evokes emotion, whether positive or negative, and brings you back to that moment in time. And lastly, a powerful picture is one you can see even after you look away. It's really interesting to have some of these professionals, non-Christians, honestly, a lot of them, they can, they can feel what a powerful picture is. They've experienced it the, themselves. These are professional photographers, people who take pictures and share pictures professionally and daily. So when we're talking about these powerful pictures in the scriptures, I really wanted to make sure the church can even develop and understand what a powerful picture is so we can develop it in our minds. So I'd like to boil this down for you in three easy to digest concepts for you this morning, okay? First concept, the picture means something. The scriptures are inspired, they're meaningful, and that I and that you and that we are an active participant in this. This isn't just some history class that we can miss and snore and snooze by. Uh, I'm homeschooling my kids. I was not the very best student growing up. Don't tell them that if they're watching. It's not some history class you can just scoot on by, get your checkbox. Nowadays, they don't even have A's and B's, right? Just present, like they don't want to offend anybody. <clears throat> I got, a, I got a P. I was there. I was present. <clears throat> Man. 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 16 and 17. Many of y'all know this. I turn to it. If it's not underlined, it's one of those you want to underline. All scripture is inspired by God and profitable for teaching, for re reproof, for correction, for training in righteousness, so that the man of God may be adequate, equipped for every good work. Romans chapter 8, 5 and 6, For those who are according to the flesh set their minds on the things of the flesh, but those who are according to the Spirit, the things of the Spirit. For the mind set on the flesh is death, but the mind set on the Spirit is life and peace, that mind set on something. 2 Corinthians chapter 2, 14 through 16, But a natural man does not accept the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness to him, and he cannot understand them, because they are spiritually appraised. But he who is spiritual appraises all things, that he himself is appraised by no one. For who has known the mind of the Lord, that he will instruct him? But we have what? The mind of Christ. To look at a picture from the prophets and to glean something from it is to admit that it's worth understanding, that even the principles can outlast the circumstance. We talked a lot of, uh, about it several times this weekend, and this passage is one of these prime examples. Jesus is not in the flesh anymore. Praise God. Could you imagine? We all love him, right? Could you imagine if he's in the flesh? The line that would fall in front of him. It's like, what do you do? I just want to talk to him. And some of us, I got to get healed. I know somebody. I just want to say hi to him. I love him. I just, oh, man, how are we, can you hold my spot? I really have to. <laughs> Praise God he's not just in the flesh anymore. Even though this picture isn't a current snapshot of the glory of the Christ, it's an integral part of his story, though. And to be without it would diminish that story. This does mean something. These scriptures are inspired. They are meaningful. And we are active participants in this. This isn't just a history class to watch. So let's go back to our passage in Isaiah 53, verse 1. And who has believed our message, and to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? And if you go back just a little bit, I know I think Phil touched on this a little bit. The Lord has bared his holy arm in uh, chapter 52, verse 10, in the sight of all the nations. He's got that arm. It's not too short. It's not too flimsy, too flabby. Can't quite reach it. Bad grip. Slippery. You know, those 
You, you've, you've shook, yeah, you know, here in Montana, you shake a lot of hands, right? That little dead fish type of thing. That's not the arm. That's not the picture we see here. <laughs> Some of y'all are like, oh, I know exactly what he's saying. Some, yeah. yeah. He grew up before him like a tender shoot, like a root out of parched ground. I feel like in this, uh, in like all the lockdowns you hear about and stuff, everyone got into house plants. Anybody get into house plants the last year and a half? Yeah, we got a couple hands. How many of y'all have killed those house plants? Yeah, <laughs> more hands. Yeah, yeah, man. It's murder. Yeah. Anybody had a garden, didn't quite tend to it correctly? A little thing comes out, you're so excited, you go out of town for a weekend, you forgot to water it. Duh, jets. You know, that's not necessarily a present picture of Jesus, this little tender shoot out of the ground. But it's important for us to understand, to partake of, to view, to see him eye to eye. Another concept we can kind of roll on to is to look for this redemption. Look for this revelation in the composition, as my friend kind of put. Even the harsh criticisms or rebukes, we can still learn something from. It might be harsh. It might be hard to understand sometimes, but we can glean good things from this. Keep your finger in Isaiah 53, but we're going to turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 6. Now these things happened as examples for us so that we would not crave evil things as they also craved. Do not be idolaters as some of them were as it is written. The people sat down to eat and to drink and stood up to play. Nor let us act immorally as some of them did. And 23,000 fell in one day. Nor let us try the Lord as some of them did and were destroyed by the serpents. Nor grumble as some of them did and were destroyed by the destroyer. Now these things happened to them as an example and they were written for our instruction upon whom the ends of the ages have come. Therefore, let him who thinks he stands take heed uh, that he does not fall. No temptation has overtaken you, but such as is common to man. And God is faithful, who will not allow you to be tempted beyond what you are able, but with the temptation will provide a way of escape also, so that you will be able to endure it. Now, I know this was talking specifically about some of the problems the Israelites were having in the desert. Many of the events covered in the book of Numbers, by the way, uh, these, in, in the book of Numbers, I know the book of Numbers sometimes can start out kind of dry for some folks. By the end of it, it's kind of like a a Michael Bay film, right? It's pretty exciting. A lot of stuff going on there. Sin is bad. Look at these consequences. This is the message that he's trying to get here. Many of the pictures from the prophets were so hated or outrageous because no one else expected what they said. They wouldn't be prophets if everybody knew what God was thinking and was going to say. God uses spokesmen for a reason. The spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak, and the people living by the flesh needed that unique prophecy. Now, by the way, that, that's not an excuse. I don't want anybody, spirit is willing, flesh is weak. Huh? That's what we got, right? It's quite the promise. Living by that spirit, having that mind of Christ. Spirit is willing, the flesh is weak, and you can overpower that flesh. Back to our text in Isaiah chapter 53, verse 4. Surely our griefs he himself bore, and our sorrows he carried, yet we ourselves esteemed him stricken, smitten of God, and afflicted, but he was pierced through for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The chastening for our well-being fell upon him. And by his scourging we are healed. All of us like sheep have gone astray. Each of us has turned to his own way. But the Lord has caused the iniquity of us all to fall on him. The surprise, right? When we try to view this picture, excuse me, come back, I'm skipping ahead. Uh, The surprise, this idea of this tender shoot, someone tossed aside, pushed aside, but look what this tender shoot grew into, the, this, this person that everyone else cast off. Look at his importance. He bore our griefs. He bore our sorrows. He was smitten and afflicted, but he was pierced through for us. Something so harsh and so negative was so positive, was so important that we partake of. A third concept here, when God showed Noah the proverbial picture of the ark, right, Noah had to put wooden beam to wooden beam. He couldn't just relax in this knowledge, attend the history class, that it involved him, that it was worth visualizing, but it inspired action, thus bringing this picture to life and having its purpose, this development. It meant something to Noah, and he did something with this. Romans chapter 6, verse 11. Mr. Doty touched on this last night. In fact, he touched about just the entire Bible. Even so, 
consider yourselves to be dead to sin, but alive to God in Christ Jesus. Okay, I'm dead to sin. Is that what consider means? This vague, blasé, I get it, okay, dead to sin. All of us know someone who refuses to consider themselves dead to sin. And it's evident because they keep on sinning. If you consider yourself dead to sin, it had better result in some changes, result in something meaningful. Let's go back to Isaiah 53. We're going to start in verse 10. But the Lord was pleased to crush him, putting him to grief. If he would render himself as a guilt offering, he will see his offspring. He will prolong his days, and the good pleasure of the Lord will prosper in his hands. As a result of the anguish of his soul, he will see it and will be satisfied. By his knowledge, the righteous one, my servant, will justify the many, as he will bear their iniquities. Therefore, I will allot him a portion with the great. And he will divide the treasure with the strong because he poured out himself to death and was numbered with the transgressors. He interceded for us. This picture was meaningful. It was relatable. It was present for us. This picture, though hard and temporary, it describes Jesus in the flesh, but was still very positive, harsh, hard to understand, but meaningful and positive for us. This picture, though heartbreaking, inspires change in us that we affirm in faith. Yeah, you might see it now. This is present, positive, affirmative, repackaged for us so that we can develop these powerful pictures in our mind. We want change. We want development. We want something to be meaningful. You can't get away from that. As a man, thanks, right? Sorry, Matt. Uh, he, him. I forgot to start everything off with that. When we try to view the picture Isaiah the prophet is showing us, if I'm being honest, it might be a little hard to reconcile at first, especially if you already have some experience with the pictures of Jesus as king or God or high priest. In fact, its power might come from some of the emotion in its voice. You can hear the bewilderment, maybe a little shock or confusion in just how flippantly we push Jesus off. Its power might come from the surprise in its composition. Maybe it's describing something in a way we're not used to seeing. The emotion we get here, you, might, you could hear my friends are really stuck on this emotion idea of a powerful picture. This emotion we get here might be kind of embarrassment at first. How the people and ourselves treated Jesus as a man and gracious. It should be a strong emotion. This is our fierce king, the God of the universe, the firstborn, the creator, our high priest. A tender, malnourished plant, shoot, out of the ground. This inspires us to appreciate Jesus a bit more than these short verses might imply. It implies that there's a little bit more to this story, this powerful picture. Is this the only picture of Jesus we have in the scriptures? You know, we can glean a tremendous amount of respect for Jesus here, but within this short chapter, it tells us a story even greater than its face value. It implies there's so much more to this story, to this picture. We know that Jesus came as a man. He's also our God. He's king of kings while also being a faithful and merciful high priest. This Isaiah picture is so powerful that we can see these breadcrumbs to each of these major portraits of Jesus. Now, I want to be careful here a little bit because I don't want to imply that the scriptures mean something different to each of us. That would be a mess, chaos. But have you ever noticed how sometimes the picture you see of Jesus might kind of shift a little bit? You read it from time to time. And maybe depending on what season of life you're in and where you might be in your faith and in your growth and certainly in your eye contact with where he is, here we see this Jesus as a man. We see him eye to eye, maybe even relate to him a little bit in how we're treated sometimes ourselves. He certainly went that distance to us. Let's turn to Hebrews chapter 2 together. Hebrews chapter 2, verse 14. Bless you. Therefore, since the children share in flesh and blood, he himself likewise also partook of the same, that through death he might render powerless him who had the power of death, that is, 
the devil. It might free those who, through fear of death, were subject to slavery all their lives. You know, back in Isaiah, we get to relate to Jesus there. Scorned, beaten, maligned. I think we're kind of experiencing some of those in varying degrees. In other pictures, we see Jesus as God, other times as king. And if we're being honest, we might have kind of a hard time seeing Jesus as king through these American lenses sometimes. You know, that's been touched on a little bit, this camp. You know, it's in our DNA to be rebellious. I want to show you all something. It's kind of, kind of weird to do it here, but I got this belt buckle. Some of you all noticed it. Um, it was my father's. He died when I was, when I was young, and I wear it. I kind of remember him, and frankly, I needed to keep my pants up. But um, <laughs> on this belt buckle, it's the Virginia State Seal. I'm in Savannah, Georgia, but I'm a Virginia boy at heart. It's a Virginia State Seal. On it is an Amazon woman holding a sword in one hand and a spear in the other. She's standing on the deposed body of King George III with his crown knocked off his head. What a powerful picture, right? Virginia State Seal, pretty impressive. Around it says, Sick Semper Tyrannus. Anybody know what that means? What was that? Thus always to tyrants. It's in our American DNA to throw off these tyrants. I think we might be ahead of ourselves sometimes if we so flippantly, you know, repeat after me, Jesus is King, Lord of, Lord of Lords, King of my life, you know, I accept him. Sometimes if we're just kind of flippant about that, without developing that picture of a good, sovereign king worth conscripting your life over to, we might have a hard time digesting that, developing that picture. That might take a little bit of time for us, for where we are and who we are. Perhaps even harder to develop in our minds is this picture of Jesus as high priest, this is going to take an intentional development process for each of these pictures to mature in our minds. It's not going to happen by accident. Osmosis, you know, you sleep near your Bible, it kind of leaks into you. It's not going to happen by accident. It'll be out of focus, blurry at best. You know, if you only attend, attend these, attend the assembly and just kind of sit, watch, observe. And actually, while I'm here, I'd like to ask you a question. This is just a little side thing for the go-getters in the class. What do you think happened if the Israelites had a bad relationship with their priest? You know, this liaison between God and his people. If the people didn't like him, hated him, I'm not confessing to that guy. I'm not going to square up with him. When it comes to do the required sacrifice, what if that calculation is off? What if the priest is untrustworthy, doesn't do his job, skimming from the top, neglecting his duties? Reminds me of... Uh, you know, putting the blood on the doorpost. Maybe the son's a little old enough to figure, hey, Dad, what are we doing? I heard this rumor. Are we going to get around to it? Yes, yeah, son, I'll get to it, son. Hey, Dad, how about now, right? What if that relationship with the person that's responsible for you was not trustworthy? What happened to that confidence? What happens there? How would you describe your relationship with your priest? Do you have one at all? You know, when I say the word priest, we're talking about pictures here. Do you picture some guy in a black robe and a cute little collar? Or do you picture Jesus, once being tempted in every way, relating to each of us perfectly, yet without sin? Still here in Hebrews chapter 2, you can go to 17. Therefore he had to be made like his brethren in all things, so that he might become a merciful and faithful high priest in things pertaining to God, to make propitiation for the sins of the people. For since he himself was tempted in that which he has suffered, he's able to come to the aid of those who are tempted. A priest that's never failing, never miscalculating this propitiation. And maybe this is a picture we need to develop more. Someone trustworthy, someone reliable. Let's segue back into how we're developing these powerful pictures from the prophets. You know, we've, always, we've already talked about some incredible pictures this weekend. You know, the strong arm of the Lord, not being so short that it can't save you. <clears throat> Excuse me. Nolan talking about the visual, visualization of our incredible privilege. Matt talking about Habakkuk and the coming capture from these impetuous Chaldeans. That's one of my favorites, by the way. I love, you know, you'll be astonished. You would never guess what I'm about to do to you, Habakkuk. And Habakkuk's like, oh, okay. That's the hair standing up on the back of the neck. If you finish that story out, the end of Habakkuk. In fact, let's, let's turn it real fast. It's, it's worth checking out. Habakkuk chapter 4. Excuse me. Chapter 3. 
chapter 3, 16, you know, these people, these Chaldeans are going to come through, wipe out, mess everything up, <laughs> really confuse people here. He says, I heard and my inward parts trembled at the sound. My lips quivered. Decay entered my bones and in my place I trembled. This guy started to see the picture and it was terrifying. Because I must wait quietly for the day of distress, for the people to arise who will invade us. Though the fig tree should not blossom and there there be no fruit on the vines, though the yield of the olive should fail and the fields produce no food, though the flock should be cut off from the fold and there be no cattle in the stalls, oh my gracious, everything. Yet I will exult in the Lord. I will rejoice in the God of my salvation. The Lord God is my strength and he's made my feet like hind's feet and makes me walk on my high places. Habakkuk had a picture developed in his mind. You know, when I think of salvation, I love talking about this, you know, I remember the old movies, you got the bad guy, he pulls up the gun slowly. Over here, the, the, the president's like talking, doing something important, and the bad guy's slowly bringing up the gun, and the secret service guy, he's like, wait a second. He sees what's going on. Yeah, I got him. And he runs, everything slows down. The bad guy's pulling up the gun, he's about to take the shot, the secret service jumps, doosh, doosh, gosh, shot in the arm, saves the day, everything's happy. He's got a parade, tickers, tape, and all that fun stuff. That's salvation, he saved him. Is that the salvation Habakkuk's about to experience? God's just going to, oh, you know what? Habakkuk prayed really good, guys. Never mind. How can Habakkuk say this is the God of my salvation when these fierce, impetuous people are going to come and wipe them out? It's important that we develop the right picture in our heads. What a disappointment it would be for Habakkuk if he says, man, the God of our salvation, guys, buckle up. It's going to be a little crazy, but he's, everything's going to be fine when they experience that discipline. They had to calibrate and develop the correct picture in their mind to not be discouraged, to experience that lesson, for it to develop into something meaningful. You know, as we flip through this photo album, it's going to take an intentional decision to develop each of these pictures. In my world of photography, y'all might have seen me bumbling around with a camera here and there, I don't really separate photos into powerful or mediocre that often. In my world, there are three pictures. The picture you trash. You know, everyone knows about that. Oh, I was blinking. You know, it didn't quite turn out. I was moving too fast. You know, something didn't quite work out. It's the picture you trash. It's not worth saving, sharing. Certainly not worth printing. The other one is, the, in fact, the photo you print. It's the photo you want kept. The one you share to Instagram, right? Get those likes, comments, all that stuff. It's printed to share, to keep, to remember that story or that moment, to lock it in there. And everything else is the picture you missed. We're talking about powerful pictures from the prophets. Each picture worth developing, printing, sharing with others. But some people, some people will hear these words and trash them. These pictures are trash. Don't be surprised when the world hates you, we hear. It's foolishness to the world, we've heard. These pictures aren't worth keeping to them. But saints, if I can offer a word of caution in a world that's actively trying to distract you, pulling your attention, luring you, wanting you to scroll and scroll and scroll and scroll. Yeah, it sounds monotonous because it is. You, just, you never get to that bottom, do you? you got a super advanced trillions of dollars worth of computer to keep your attention. It's terrifying when you really think about it. Scroll. To point that camera in your mind at the wrong subject. Too many times, these powerful pictures are just missed. It's happened. Where were you looking? It's written in blood, in sweat, in tears, in ink, in stone. Beautiful pictures teaching us how to live, not just how to build the ark, but how to fill it with people this time. Something beautiful and exciting we can behold. But all too often, we miss the shot. Oh, man, missed it. Duh. We were distracted. We were divided. Trump, Biden, COVID, Delta, Taliban, election fraud, gender, censorship, race theory. We, we missed it. Where's our focus? Where's our attention? Where's our camera point? And I'm not saying be ignorant, but man, if that's the only picture you're developing in your head, that developer, that computer up there, what pictures are getting developed in your mind daily? These powerful pictures from the prophets, or whatever, Facebook, TikTok, or Fox News, CNN, MP, whatever it is, is that what's getting developed? Is that what you're pointing your camera at? 
Like I said, if these processes before sound familiar, it should. I hope they do. It's present, positive, affirmative thinking. This vocabulary is a little different when we're talking about pictures, but it really is the same. If you want to develop these powerful pictures, instead of missing the shot, you've got to point your mind's camera at the right subject. You've got to set your eyes on things above. You have to affirm that these pictures are worth developing, that God wants to include you in this development process. And it's not something someone else can do for you that you'll eventually get around to it one day. Now, I've saved the really complicated stuff for last. Okay, buckle up. I know some of us are in these comfy seats. Get to that edge. Listen up close. Really, really complicated stuff. But if I wanted to take a photo of, let's say, Sue Nguyen. Where's that good-looking guy? If I want to take a picture of Sue, where do I point my camera? Right at it. Look at that. Look at that face. I got to point it right at him. I got to point it right at Sue Nguyen. And I know that sounds really complicated, really tough, hard to understand. Listen to the recording, play it back, half speed, soon win. Half speed, that's the dirty thing. That's what we need to do. Never mind. Okay. <laughs> Mental note. I know that sounds complicated, but how many times are we guilty of the exact same thing? When the world tries to redefine love, saying, love is love. No, God is love. We're so surprised that the world can't define genders when biblical masculinity, femininity, is rare, unrecognizable, or you're not allowed to talk about it. Roles, responsibilities, duties. No, shh, let's not talk about those things. We're so perplexed that the world can understand when the church sometimes doesn't either. The world is captured in fear of death when the one who has power over death has been defeated. Where, O oh, death, is your victory? Where, O oh, death, is your sting? Too often we've pointed our cameras in the wrong direction, and we're left scratching our head when we get our developed pictures back. What happened? I bought doubles of these things. Why, why are there, do you remember that? Sorry. <clears throat> what is this? I think you got my film switched. What happened? I don't recognize any of these pictures. I, was, I thought I was developing character of Christ, something important. What are all these? And the good news I want to leave you with today is as easy as it is to miss the picture sometimes, our all-powerful and patient God wants to make sure that you never miss another. In fact, and please forgive me for how cheesy this is about to sound, God wants to take a selfie with you. <laughs> but, I know, cringe. Yeah. But let's keep this illustration going just for a second. These powerful pictures that we develop, God has included you, wants to include you. And today, man, if you're tired of pointing that camera to the ground, do the wrong thing. If you're tired of all your pictures coming out blurry, out of focus, destined for the trash, let's point that camera in the right direction. If the messages you've heard this weekend are convicting you, you want to fully develop these pictures, you can do that today. Let's do it today. Scriptures tell us to believe. Believe in these things. They're meaningful. They're important. They're worth studying. Worth knowing. Scriptures tell us to repent. Go let those old photos go. Recalibrate that camera. Really define which photos are worth developing and which aren't. Repent. Confess. Jesus is Lord. Boy, it's worth developing these pictures in your mind. I've had a hard time doing it, and I want to change. Confess that stuff. Be immersed. Clean it out. Get the forgiveness of sins, the gift of that Holy Spirit. And with God's help, you're going to keep that camera of your mind pointed where it belongs. If you want to talk to someone about that today, I'd love to talk to you. I bet a lot of people in this tent would love to talk to you. If you want 52 Bible studies, you can talk to Steve Doty afterwards, too. <laughs> today's, the day, today's the day to do that. Thank you for your time.